Thank you so much for having me. It really is a treat uh, to connect even remotely to a wonderful audience uh, like this. And to get started, I do have a question for everyone. Raise your hand, raise that virtual hand. If you have ever died in space before, I want to know who's who's new to this whole game. But if you've died in space before, uh, you, you can you can you can skip a lot of this because all this is old news to you. But no hands, no hands. I'm scrolling through. Okay, okay. So it looks like it looks like this is first time dying in space for everyone. That is great news. Uh, so that this is new information for everyone. I'm going to switch screens here. Uh, yes, uh, the talk is full of cheesy jokes exactly like that. Uh, I am going to share my presentation here. Uh, this is the cover of the book that you can find at the Ruth Keeler Memorial Library and also bookstores nationwide and also in Amazon. <sighs> and this book is a journey. Uh, it's right there in the subtitle. It's a journey and and for this talk, I would like to take all of you on a very special journey. So all of you are going to be honorary space cadets on, a, on your very first intergalactic voyage into the depths of space. Let me show you though, before we take off, before we take off, let me show you how, where we're going in the sky. It's right right here i guess it's it's i mean you can see the constellation the, the virgo constellation leo there's some major stars arcturus and spica and what it looks like we're headed to is a big patch of nothing so let me zoom in a bit this is a view of the night sky let me zoom in a bit okay that didn't help much that didn't help much i swear i i think i see can you guys see that i think i see a tiny little fuzzy patch i wonder if there's some let's, let's do another round of zoom in let's do them before we take off on our mission it's very important very important to know where we're going ah there's our target it is called the Virgo Galaxy, also known as M87 or Messier 87. This galaxy is tens of millions of light years away. And we want to go there because there is something very cool there waiting for us. But this is space. We're here on Earth. The Virgo Galaxy is tens of millions of light years away. We've got a little bit of traveling to do. It's going to take a while. I hope you brought a snack. I hope you went to the bathroom before we left because there's no gas stations. There's no rest areas. There are no restaurants. There are no motels. You get in your spaceship and you're just going to go for tens of millions of light years. How long is it going to take? It depends on how fast your ship is, honestly. Even if you're traveling at the speed of light, it would take tens of millions of years. So it's going to be a while, okay? But just, but just be patient, all right? It's worth it because our target of the Virgo galaxy, there, I swear there's something cool there that is just going to totally blow your mind. It'll be worth it. But first, we have to escape the solar system. Now, the solar system isn't exactly a friendly place. Here we are on the Earth orbiting the sun. We've got things like the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt. We've got all the planets. We've got some dwarf planets. I'm not going to get into the whole thing between planet and dwarf planet unless you want me to. Feel free to ask a question in the chat. And uh, by the way, keep asking questions during the chat. I'm going to ignore them until the end. And then we'll go back through and we'll pick out some fun questions to answer. I'm going to save plenty of time at the, at the end. For anyone who's still alive, I will answer your question. Now, the solar system's our home, right? This is where we live. This is where we grew up. Life has been flourishing on the earth for like 4 billion years. It sh it, you would hope that at least our journey would start off without any dangers. You would hope that you would be wrong. The first thing you have to face when you leave our atmosphere is the fact that there is no atmosphere in space. 
It's empty. It's a vacuum. There's nothing to breathe. That's why astronauts like this one have to wear these big bulky suits because they have to carry around all their air with them as they go. It's like scuba diving, but way worse and way drier and way colder too. The, the temperature of space is around three degrees above absolute zero. So I can't uh, emphasize this enough. You need your air and you need to stay protected because if you are exposed to vacuum, it is not going to be a good day for you. You don't die instantly. So you got that going for you. Unlike some of the other things we're going to see in this journey, you don't die instantly. But what happens is as soon as you're exposed to vacuum, all the water, all the oils on your skin, the tears in your eyes will instantly sublimate, instantly turn to ice and float off of you. And that will give you a nasty, nasty uh, skin damage that's not going to be pretty, but you're still alive. You're not going to explode even though there's a vacuum around you, even though there's zero air pressure around you, you're not gonna explode because your skin is really good at keeping your insides on the inside of you. So it will maintain your pressure. You're not gonna blow up. You're gonna puff up to around twice your normal size. Still relatively bad, but not dead. What actually kills you in the vacuum is the lack of air in your lungs. There's no air in your lungs because you've been exposed to vacuum, but your heart is still pumping and still circulating your blood. Your blood comes up to your lungs where it comes up normally to pick up some oxygen. There's no oxygen, but it keeps on flowing. And so very quickly, the oxygen levels in your blood drops. The first thing to shut off is your brain. You will go to sleep in around 10 to 20 seconds. And then once all your organs starve of oxygen, this is a condition that uh, the medical community tells me is known as death and is generally advised to be avoided. But that takes a couple minutes. That takes a couple minutes to happen. If you're brought back inside, if you're revived, if you're given oxygen in those two minutes, you can make a somewhat decent recovery depending on how much brain damage you've had but you're only going to be conscious for that for the first 10 or 20 seconds. So you've got 10 or 20 seconds of flailing around in the vacuum of space to find safety. Otherwise you're going to have to rely on your friends and your friends may have been the ones to kick you out of the spaceship in the first place. So I don't know. I'm giving you 50, 50 odds of making it. You will eventually freeze to death, but that takes a couple of hours in space. Uh, but if you happen to be close to the sun, you won't freeze to death at all. But so for this whole journey, make sure you pack a pressure suit, make sure you pack some, some breathable air, uh, at least 10 million years worth. I might suggest 20 or 30 million years worth just so you have some backup. But once you got a little bit of space under your belt, we can start our journey. We can uh, start inching our way out of the solar system. But as we do, we're going to run into some other threats. And those threats come from the sun itself. The sun itself is not exactly pretty. The sun itself from here on the surface of the earth looks all calm and nice and friendly. You know, we always draw with a smiley face, uh, but no, this right here, what you're seeing, this is not an artist conception. This is not a computer simulation. This is the real sun. This is a picture of what's called a prominence. This is an arch of plasma launched from the surface of the sun in a fit of magnetic fury. Sometimes these prominences just return back to the surface. Sometimes they launch out into space and they will take a big bucket of sun stuff of plasma and launch it into space. We call these a coronal mass ejection. This is the sun barfing into the solar system. These balls of plasma are larger than planets, travel a good fraction of the speed of light and if they hit you, it is bad 
news. These are high energy particles. These are electromagnetic storms. They will scramble circuitry. They will scramble bodies. If one is headed towards you, you need to hunker down inside your spaceship. You need to shut down electronics so that they don't get messed up. And you need to cross your fingers that you will make it out the other side. Thankfully, right now, as I speak, our sun is in a relatively quiet phase. So it's not going to be too bad. It's not throwing all, out a lot of these coronal mass ejections or prominences or flares. So now is a good time. I wouldn't wait if you're going to leave five years from now when our sun cycles up to being relatively active. I might advise staying safe on a planet, but for now it's a relatively calm time. So it's a good time to get outside of the solar system. But as you start to cross the solar system, you're going to run into creatures like this. This is a comet. And comets and asteroids are dangerous for a few reasons. One, they're small, which makes them hard to see. Two, they're not very bright. They're kind of dark, which makes them hard to see. Three, they're moving at tens of thousands of miles per hour. You wanna see what happens when something big is traveling at tens of thousands of miles an hour and runs into a planet? You get something like this. You get Big boom. All right, just ask the dinosaurs how, how much they enjoyed having a comet strike the surface of the earth. Oh, right, you can't ask the dinosaurs because they all died because a rock just a few miles across struck the earth at over 30,000 miles per hour when it did, it literally shook the planet, triggered earthquakes, triggered volcanoes, ignited, sent a tsunami that was 200 feet high into the Gulf of Mexico. The material ejected from the blast reached halfway to the moon and then rained back down onto the planet as molten birdshot that ignited forest fires across the world kicked up so much material and dust into the atmosphere, blotted out the sun for thousands of years, and killed 80% of all land creatures. Could you imagine what this would do if it were to hit your spaceship? Guess who's going to win in spaceship versus comet? It's going to be comet every time. And if you're just worried about the big ones, mm, you need to be worried about the small ones too. There are micrometeorites. There are little tiny things like the size of a bullet that are going tens of thousands of miles per hour. They're going to cut through your ship like a hot knife through butter. What's the best strategy? Well... In our solar system, there's a few areas of asteroid concentration. We have the asteroid belt, which sits between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. Jupiter itself, sharing the orbit of Jupiter, we have something called the Trojans. These are groups of asteroids. They're just hanging along with Jupiter. Uh, as long as you avoid these, you're relatively okay. It's kind of hard to not avoid them because the asteroid belt completely rings the sun. Thankfully, asteroids aren't grouped together very tightly. It's not like a Hollywood movie. You can generally sail through the asteroid belt and the nearest asteroid will be millions of miles away from you if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, well, you didn't get very far in your interstellar adventure, but you know, that's the breaks. But just if you get past the orbit of Jupiter, it's not safe quite yet because we have something called the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is on the very outskirts of the solar system. This is at the orbit of Pluto and even further. We have sent a few spacecraft out past the edges of the solar system, past the Kuiper Belt, the Voyager probes, the Pioneer probes, the New Horizons probe, which is in the Kuiper Belt right now. The Kuiper Belt is like the asteroid belt, but colder and bigger. 
it's not a fun place either. Just because it's cold and mostly made of ice doesn't mean they're going to be any bit nicer to you. But if you make it through the asteroid belt, the Trojans, and the Kuiper belt, you are generally considered to be outside the solar system. So up until that point, if you've survived that far, it's only been an interplanetary adventure. Once you make it out of the solar system, it truly becomes an interstellar adventure. Remember, we've got to head to the Virgo galaxy. That's a whole other galaxy. So we are just getting started right now. So here's a map of our local system. These are some of the stars we might encounter on our trajectory outside of the galaxy. We have our sun here in the center with the solar system. We have things like Sirius and Alpha Centauri and Barnard Star. These are a few light years away from us. Uh, a little bit further, you get to Vega and Tea Garden Star. All of these stars on this map are dangerous. All of these stars are large. All of these stars are near the end of their lives. All of these stars are likely to go boom in the time it takes you to cross these depths. So if I had to pick a safe direction, it would be none of the above. I would just stay at home if I wanted to be safe, but we don't want to be safe. We want to see what mystery awaits us in the Virgo galaxy. But first step, we actually have to get out of the Milky Way galaxy. And to do that means we're going to have to encounter some more hazards. For example, we have cosmic rays. Now, cosmic rays are not rays. They're not radiation. Cosmic rays are tiny little particles. And I know what you're thinking. Tiny little particles. What could be so bad about tiny little particles? Well, how about tiny little particles traveling 99.999% the speed of light? Still not impressed? Okay, fine. Okay, fine. These tiny little particles, when they hit you, they go right through your cells. They're tiny enough for that. They penetrate their cells. And every once in a while, a cosmic ray will strike your DNA. And it's like a little tiny microscopic pair of scissors that snips apart your DNA. Now, most of the time, your cells are able to deal with this. They see a broken DNA strand. They can repair it. They can work around it. Sometimes they can't. And this can lead to uncontrollable replication, a.k.a. cancer. Even on the surface of the Earth, with our, hundred, our, our tens of miles of atmosphere and our protective magnetic field, cosmic rays, deadly cosmic rays, still reach the surface. And it's estimated that around 3% of all cancers that humans get come from deep space. These cosmic rays come from everywhere. They come from supernova, from dying stars, from stars having fits, uh, to giant black holes, everything. They completely soak the universe. The best chance of avoiding cosmic rays is staying under a thick atmosphere behind a strong magnetic field. Out there in the depths of interstellar space, you've got your spaceship walls. So what are you going to do to avoid it? There really isn't much you can do to avoid it. You just have to sit there and take it. And that is going to be a thing for the whole entire journey. But that's not all. That's not all. You might, in your journeys, encounter something very, very pretty. On our way to the Virgo galaxy, we might pass by something like this, a beautiful nebula with effervescent blue features and, and dark clouds, dark nebula. This looks gorgeous. We might be tempted to stop by, take a visit, take a couple pictures. If you see something beautiful like this, it's like seeing a beautiful orange frog in the jungle. It may be pretty, but it is poisonous. You get close to it and it can kill you. You get close to one of these things and it is going to be bad news. Why? Because this is where stars are being born. And stars are born in turbulence. Stars are born in strong physics of, of extreme magnetic fields, of flows of gas colliding with each other. And then when stars are born, they eject material in high intensity radiation. You know how this nebula is lit up? 
It's lit up by the ultraviolet and X-ray radiation from newborn stars. When was the last time that you have ever heard that ultraviolet and X-ray radiation is a good thing to get close to? I didn't think so. So if you see a stellar nursery like this, just give it a wide detour. All right, just go right around it. Don't try going through it. You will regret it. But that's not all. As we cruise the interstellar depths, we might, if we're unlucky enough, encounter our first black hole. Black holes sometimes are found in pairs with a star orbiting it, sometimes are found solitary like this. Black holes are the ultimate question mark, the ultimate one-way trip. If you cross the boundary of a black hole, the boundary of a black hole is called the short shield radius. If you cross that boundary, you will not escape because nothing can escape a black hole, not even light. Gravity is so strong inside of a black hole, is pulling everything so strongly that not even light can escape. So what do you think your chances are? But you don't have to fall through a black hole in order to be killed by one. Because of the extremely strong gravity around a black hole, if you're near a black hole, it can kill you because the gravity at your feet will be a little bit stronger than the gravity at your head, just by a tiny bit, just by a tiny bit. But with a black hole that is strong enough to stretch you out, literally stretch you into a line of goo like pasta. The scientific name we give to this process is spaghettification. And it is not as fun as it sounds. Before you even get this close to a black hole, you will get spaghettified and then you will get slurped up by the black hole. How to avoid a black hole? They're black, okay? Space is black. Not a lot of contrast. Kind of hard to see. If a star happens to be orbiting a black hole, some of that material from the star might be falling into the black hole and you can see the material as it's falling in. Stay away from those. If it's a lonesome black hole out in the middle of nowhere, good luck. But if this is on your, your front view, I suggest turning, all right? But you're going to encounter them on our journey, on our way outside the galaxy. But there's more. Stars, when they're born, are incredibly violent and dangerous places to go. This, this is, by the way, is called the cat's eye nebula. It's another nebula. This is what happens when stars like our sun die. When stars like our sun die, they turn themselves inside out and then push a good fraction of their own atmospheres out into the surrounding system. There's all sorts of complicated physics that takes place, which makes each nebula like this, and these are called planetary nebula, makes them each different, each one's unique. They don't last too long. They only last about 10,000 years or so, which isn't too long when it comes to astronomy. But stars like our sun are so common that any one galaxy is uh, studded with these kinds of nebulae. Again, this is a region where a star is literally turning itself inside out. So yes, it looks pretty. It looks pretty from afar. If you try to go in there, try to go to that heart to explore what's happening, you're going to be rocked by high energy radiation. You're going to be buffeted by waves of plasma and strong magnetic fields. Think of the forces and energies it took to sculpt a nebula like this and imagine it doing it to you. So once again, nature is showing you something pretty. That pretty thing is best enjoyed from afar. Speaking of stars dying, here's another thing that you might encounter on your journey away from our galaxy as you're cruising through interstellar space. Stars come in pairs. About half the stars in the universe are in some sort of binary system. 
one of them can die first. And when stars like our sun die, they leave behind a strange object, object known as a white dwarf. A white dwarf is a compact remnant of a star like our sun. And then that other star in the binary system can also approach the end of its life. And when it does, it swells and turns red, becomes a red giant. Some of that material can swirl onto the neutron star, or sorry, the white dwarf. And if the density of that material reaches a critical threshold, it's like lighting a match on top of gasoline. A thermo, a runaway thermonuclear explosion happens on the surface. The whole atmosphere of the white dwarf goes boom. Sometimes the white dwarf itself explodes in a giant fury. We call these novae and supernovae. If you see a system like this, where a dead star is feeding on the remnants or on the flesh of its still living companion, you want to be as far away from poss as possible because at any moment without any warning, one day you're looking at a binary star, the next day a giant blast wave of radiation is pl and plasma is heading to you at nearly the speed of light. And it can happen like that. No trigger, no warning, just happening. And these are going to irradiate the region around them for hundreds, if not thousands of light years. So give them a wide berth. It's not gonna be a straight line out of our galaxy. You're gonna have to do a lot of detours. But if we make it out of our galaxy, we truly enter intergalactic space. We enter the great voids between the galaxies. Our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, is five million light years away. And we have to go well past it to reach the Virgo galaxy, our target. So as we pass out of the Milky Way galaxy, as we pass through interstellar er, intergalactic space on our way to the Virgo galaxy, we might pass through some neighboring galaxies. We're gonna have to pass into the Virgo galaxy itself, which is a much bigger galaxy than the Milky Way. And as we do, we're going to encounter some very strange, exotic, and powerful things. Because now we're in the deep universe. We're in uncharted regions of the universe. Things like Novi or planetary nebulae or plant, uh, stellar nurseries. That's child's play to what we're going to encounter out here. I'm talking about things like supernova. When a giant star dies, a star at least eight times more massive than the sun, when it reaches the end of its life, it builds a core of iron. The intense gravitational weight of the entire star compresses that iron core into a giant ball of neutrons. All that material, all that material in the rest of the star, eight times the mass of the sun, goes crunching down onto that ball of neutrons, bounces off of it and releases all of its energy in a single explosion. A single supernova explosion can outshine an entire galaxy. A galaxy is made of hundreds of millions of stars. So one supernova, one giant star dying is brighter than hundreds of millions of stars. In one day, in one day, a supernova will, will release more energy than our sun will over its entire 8 billion year lifespan. That's a lot of energy. You don't want to be near a, any supernova. If you see a star that is approaching the end of its life, and it's big, it's at least eight times more massive than the sun, and it's red and bloated and giant. These are the warning signs that at any moment, the critical nuclear reactions could be happening in the core, and it's going to go kablooey. And you won't be able to tell by looking at the surface when that's going to happen. We have a star near Earth called Betelgeuse. It's in the constellation Orion. It is a red giant star. It is massive. It is about ready to blow any day now. And I mean within the next million years or so. 
when Betelgeuse goes supernova, it will be so bright that it will be visible during the daytime as a new star. It will be outshine the full moon. You'll be able to go in the middle of the night and have enough light to cast shadows, to read a book by the light of a star 600 light years away. It won't kill anything. It's far enough away, thankfully, and it's not big enough. But imagine being 100 light years away from it or 10 light years away from it. You're going to do more than read a book by the light of that supernova. But as we go deeper into space, things get even more exotic. We start to find some very strange creatures. And what you see here is an artist's conception of what we call a magnetar. Now, the reason this is an artist's conception is that no one has been able to get up close to a magnetar to take an actual picture of one without survive and survive to tell the tale. Magnetars are made of neutron stars. Neutron stars are the leftover cores of some of the biggest stars in our universe. They are some of the most strangest and densest objects in the universe. What you see here, this magnetar is made of almost pure neutrons. It is something around three or four times the mass of the sun compressed into a ball no bigger than your neighborhood, just a few miles across. Neutron stars are so dense that if you were to take a thimble full of it, just a tiny, tiny little bit of neutron star material, it would weigh more than the Great Pyramids. If you were to take a bucket full, it would weigh more than the entire Earth. These stars are orbiting at thousands of revolutions per minute. That's faster than a kitchen blender. The gravity on neutron stars is so strong that it can bend light around it into the path of a circle. The tallest mountain on a neutron star is just an inch high. And if you were to stand on that mountain, which you couldn't because you would be squished, but if you could and you fell off that mountain, by the time you fell one inch, you would be traveling about 80% of the speed of light. These are big deals. And the worst of the neutron stars are the magnetars. The magnetars host the strongest magnetic fields in the entire universe. They are a quadrillion times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. If you were to approach within a thousand miles of a magnetar, the strong magnetic fields would literally dissolve you. And that's not even counting the X-ray and ultraviolet radiation. So while these are strange and exotic beasts that defy understanding, they are also dangerous. But it gets worse way worse. On our journey to M87, to the Virgo galaxy, we may encounter a remnant of the early universe. We don't know for sure if these things exist. What you're looking at is a hypothetical cosmic string. A cosmic string is a hypothetical object that was forged in the earliest seconds of the Big Bang itself. It is a defect. It is a crack in space-time. If cosmic strings exist, they will be very strange. They might stretch across the entire universe. They can bend the space-time around them so much that if you were to go in a circle around them, it wouldn't even add up to 360 degrees. It can bend the path of light and split images in two, and it could split you into. This is a fundamental flaw in the universe itself. Do you think you want to mess with it? Now, like I said, these are hypothetical. We have not observed any cosmic strings, but we're on a journey to another galaxy here. Who knows which strange creatures lurk in these depths? Speaking of strange creatures, there's a chance. We may not be alone in our journey. We may not be the only ones headed to M87, the Virgo galaxy. Is there life out there in the universe? Maybe. 
We, right now, we have absolutely no evidence for any life outside of the Earth. As far as we can tell, we are absolutely alone. We have not heard any signals. We have not seen any strange happenings. No one's responded to our hellos. But life may be common. Life happened here on Earth, and what's so special about the Earth? Why couldn't have it happened somewhere else? But if life could happen somewhere else, if life is coming, then where is everybody? We just don't know. You may be the first to find out in your journey to the Virgo galaxy. I've told you that it's a long trip. I've told you that it's going to take tens of millions of years to get to the Virgo galaxy. So you might be tempted to take a shortcut. You might find a wormhole and think, oh, this is just like the movies. I just slip into one side of the wormhole and I pop out the other and I can cut down on that journey. I don't even need to bring a snack. Well, here's a word of warning to you. As far as we know, wormholes can exist, but they have one fatal flaw. They are critically unstable, which means as soon as anything, as soon as anything at all, even one single bit of light passes down the tunnel of a wormhole, it instantly destabilizes and collapses. So if you were to see the entrance of a wormhole and fall down into it, most likely scenario is that you would be atomized and your atoms would be scattered throughout the known universe. So technically you would have achieved interstellar travel, but probably not in the method that you had hoped. Nature doesn't like a cheater. If you see a wormhole, do not be tempted. You can only take the long and slow route to the Virgo galaxy. But now we're beginning to approach it. We've survived solar flares, asteroids and comets, small black holes, stellar nurseries, supernova, regular novae, hypernovae, that's a thing. We didn't see any cosmic strings or aliens or wormholes in our journey. We are approaching the Virgo galaxy, which you can see in the bottom left. But as we get closer, we see it grow larger and larger in our view. And as we inch ever closer to this mass of hundreds of billions of stars, we see a strange feature. You see that blue squiggly thing? coming out of the side of the center of the Virgo galaxy. Ah, that's pointing to our target. That's pointing to where we want to go, the mystery at the heart of this galaxy. Let's get a little bit closer. As we look closer, we see that it's a long jet of plasma. This jet is stretching thousands of light years long. And it's leading us somewhere, somewhere deep in the heart of this galaxy, somewhere deep in the densest, most dangerous part. Should we turn back now, go back to safety, return to Earth? Or should we see what secrets the Virgo galaxy has in its center? What's generating this jet? As we get closer, to the core, we see a vast swirl of turbulent matter, of plasma, of stars and clouds of gas ripped apart, crunched down into something in it called an accretion disk. These accretion disks have incredibly powerful electric and magnetic fields that twist and turn and shape the material and are capable of launching these jets of, of plasma thousands of light years. There's something down there powering this material is flowing in and spinning around something is attracting all this stuff down into the center of the virgo galaxy let's get a little closer what do we see we see a black hole but not any black hole at the center of this disk of accretion and material in the heart of the virgo galaxy we see a giant black hole this black hole is billions of times more massive than our sun. If it were placed in our home solar system, it would stretch out to the orbit of Pluto. 
that massive beast is what is pulling, gravitationally pulling all this material, driving this massive engine that we call a quasar. Let's get closer. Earth astronomers last year released an image, an image of this giant black hole at the heart of the Virgo galaxy. This is their picture. This is using a network of telescopes that spanned the entire planet Earth. You see the ring of material and you see a shadow in the center. You see the image of the black hole itself. As we get closer, our view looks something like this. The material around the giant black hole gets squashed into a thin disk that spins around it. But the gravity around the black hole is so strong that the light from the disk behind the black hole goes up and around it so we can see this halo. What will happen if we plunge into a black hole? Well, giant black holes are interesting. You can cross their event horizons. That's right. You can enter a giant black hole. The differences in gravity that lead to this spaghettification only happen with small, outside a black hole when it's a small black hole. For a big black hole, you can cross that boundary and still survive. And once you do, well, that's the ultimate mystery, isn't it? We're here. We might as well make the leap, right? Thank you uh, so much for going on this journey with me. Like I said, I want to save plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pull up the chat. Guys, if you have any questions for me, feel free to type in the chat. Or if you would like to ask, ask a question uh, verbally with your microphone, go ahead and raise your hand uh, or do one of the other reactions or give a thumbs up or something in, uh, in Zoom. And uh, we can unmute you to get your questions in. So I'll give you a little bit of time uh, to ask your questions if you'd like. But no matter what, I hope you enjoyed the journey and um, buy the book and don't die in space. Can you all do me a big, big favor and please just stay on the planet Earth. I know the giant black hole, M87, is a big mystery. I know we don't fully understand what's behind black holes. You know, let's just figure it out from the safety of home. Thank you so much uh, for joining me tonight. I have a question, Paul. Uh, were some of those images actual photographs taken or the simulations or? Wow. Right, so in the presentation, I did mix it up. Some of these were actual images like the image of the black hole that was real. Those jets, the pictures of the jets that we were seeing, those were real. The picture of the alien, that was fake. Um, <laughs> the picture of the nebulae of the stellar nursery of the planetary nebula, those were real. The picture of the comet and the surface of the, surface of the sun, those were real. Things like the supernovae happening uh, or the binary stars or the magnetars, we don't have any close up pictures of those. So those were fake or not fake. Those were based on everything we know, but they were artist conceptions. Um, we had a chat question. Are black holes a theoretical concept or a collapsed star? Oh, great question. So as far as we can tell, black holes really are real things. All of our observations of black holes, including that picture that I showed you, come from uh, or agree with everything we understand black holes to actually be. We don't fully understand what's inside of a black hole, but they are acting exactly as we predicted. We have not found a single contradiction between the black holes that we see and how they behave and what we think they ought to behave like. May I ask a question? Yeah. Okay, hi. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much. You, your presentation was wonderful. Just so humorous, but also so informative. 
Um, will you be doing other presentations like these? The reason I ask is I had encouraged several of my grandchildren who are adolescents, you know, into teens to be with us here tonight. But it was the last day of school, even mm. though it's homeschool. And, you know, that that's a little bit of a conflict. You can't do this on the last night of school, right? Yes. <laughs> um, oh, for yeah. sure. But I think really, um, I was a middle school teacher, and I think your presentation would be so appealing to young people and so informative. Do you think you'll be doing more of these that kids could access? Yes, I will be doing more virtual uh, events uh, this summer and then in-person events starting in the fall. The yeah. next one up is Tuesday, next Tuesday of the 30th at 7 p.m. I'll be doing a virtual event with the Boston Museum of Science. Okay. Uh, and so you can, you can do a search for Boston Museum of Science, How to Die in Space, and you can get the event, Eventbrite link and, um, and, and join me there. Okay, great. I just wondered if kids would be able to access it. So that's terrific. And I'll be buying your book. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, oh, we got a chat question uh, from Diane uh, asking, I don't understand why you're not spaghettified in a large black hole, but only in small ones. A uh, great question. The spaghettification mm -hmm. happens because of differences in gravity. And black holes, I didn't get into this much in the presentation, I left it intentionally vague, uh, is that all the stuff in a black hole is concentrated into an infinitely tiny point at the center called the singularity. And in small black holes, the event horizon is close to that singularity, so that as you approach the, the event horizon, the differences in gravity get too strong and you get destroyed. With big black holes, the event horizon is very far away. So you can cross that boundary without getting spaghettified. But once you enter, you will get spaghettified, but you can survive entering the black hole. And we have another, we have another question. I don't know if it's on your screen. How empty is intergalactic space compared to interstellar space? Mm. Generally, intergalactic space is much emptier than interstellar space, around 10 to 100 times emptier. That's because the galaxies are collections of stars and nebula, and there's particles whizzing around and like random dust grains and everything and hydrogen atoms, the whole deal. Uh, galaxies are like the major cities. And then the intergalactic regions, those are like the vast cornfields of the Midwest where I grew up. It's just a whole lot of nothing. And we have another question. I would like to ask if you physically feel stretched during spaghettification or is it just a stretch of space? Uh, do you physically feel stretched? You absolutely do. You will get, if you were to approach a black hole, you would literally get stretched out. Uh, we have seen stars pass too close to black holes and they get ripped apart from the exact same forces. And I've got a question here from Trevor appearing on my screen. How do space core programs manage to avoid micrometeorites? The answer is they don't. Uh, one of the reasons that spacesuits are so thick and bulky is so that they can absorb micrometeorites without actually penetrating the spacesuit, but there really is no way to avoid it. 